I'm Mark Cohen from UC Berkeley, ex-USG. <coughs> I see a lot of ex-USG colleagues here as well. Uh, you might adjust the chair so that you face the whole audience. And um, anyway, so we're moderating, I'm moderating the IP section of, of this, of today's discussion. Of course, IP, intellectual property rights is initially at least at the core of the Section 301 investigation, which led to the trade sanctions, which has led to the truce, which has led to discussions about security, about whether the U.S. is trying to contain China, about the future of bilateral relations, about the Thucydides trap, and a lot of other very big issues, which is quite humbling for a guy who dabbles in patents and more obscure issues that were all of a sudden into these big, big picture issues. And our first uh, discussant is gonna be Yabo Lin from Sidley and Austin, who will tell us about some of the innovation and IP issues. Hello, everybody. How are you doing? Good. I don't hear a lot of optimistic <laughs> response. How is everybody? Good. <laughs> hey, this is California. Let's uh, uh, have a good intellectual discussion here. So I truly enjoyed the last two panels or the last two speakers, but I wanted to say something before I get into the intellectual property and R&D panel, which is uh, overall, you know, uh, I just hope that the cool heads will prevail. We need to, as a nation, I'm a US citizen, as a nation, we need to rise above the fray of the emotions or emotions, motions and emotions of the moment. I, I sounded very deep. My son would say that, hmm, that's very shallow. Uh, but uh, truly, uh, you know, I think let's um, try to remember that we're in one humanity. The oneness in every one of us needs to sort of rise above the ash of infighting, McCarthyism, ideology, differences. So with all that, I wanted to talk a little bit about China and US in the IP development realm. Specifically, I wanted to pose questions instead of you know, preaching for ideas. I wanted to show you a few charts illustrating in the last about 10, 11 years, how things look like in terms of R&D investments between China and the US. You can see that US in 2007 was three times, four times bigger than China in terms of R&D expenditure. And then China almost catches up in 2017 with a striking distance from the United States merely, you know, four trillion dollars. So I, uh, four billion dollars, sorry. So you see the chart, the US is almost even, or you can say trendy downward a little bit. And then China every year is going up. So the question is, is it wrong for China to heavily invest in R&D? Again, that's an intellectual question. Let me show you the next chart. The top 20 companies in terms of the R&D investment in 2018, and this is not from China. This is from the EU Industrial R&D Investment Scoreboard. They just issued about three weeks ago. And it shows that Huawei is number five. Huawei invested in R&D, real money, real dollar, more than Intel, Apple, and indeed more than Siemens, which is number 20. And Samsung is number one. Alphabet in our backyard is number two. Volkswagen is number three. Microsoft, number four. Again, is it wrong for Huawei to invest so much money in R&D? Why are we feeling so uncomfortable by a Chinese <coughs> company investing so much and so quickly in R&D? And here is another chart that show more of a comparative study. And this is the data that my hardworking associates, Charlie and Ching, put together. They went to the annual reports 
And God is data, so I can say that this is our intellectual property. <laughs> so I did not steal anything from the US uh, uh, academic work. But uh, so uh, the red color, the red bar is, uh, is Huawei. And uh, when you see the Huawei chart, it's going up. So in 2017, it's almost $12 billion. And then when you look at the bar about Ericsson, which is a competitor in the telecom infrastructure business, they used to, do, they used to make cell phones, but they're still making cell phones. So why are they, making, are they not making cell phones? So look at the blue line. Their R&D expenditure has been <coughs> flat in the last eight years or seven years. And Huawei is increasing every year. And look at Apple. Apple is a company of innovation. And Apple's R&D expenditure matches that. And then you look at Samsung, the same thing. It's increasing almost every year and still the number one in R&D expenditure. How can Samsung become number one? Because they spend a lot of money in R&D. And they have a culture of wolf. The corporate culture of wolf is that you need to be hungry, you need to do war hard. You know the famous saying in China? It's called bai jia hei. That means that you work day and night. And then there's another saying that you work uh, 996. Nine, nine, I don't work that hour, so I don't know. Uh, <laughs> uh, that means that you, you work from 9 a.m. to 9 p.m. And then on Saturday, you work on Saturday as well. So I, I almost asked Ching and Charlie to give me the chart of light at night in Chinese Zhongguan Chun, the high-tech company campus and the lights of Silicon Valley around the corporate campuses. At midnight, all these buildings are lit. The young people are still working there. Again, I'm not making any assertion of views. I'm just asking questions. What's wrong with people working hard? In terms of R&D expenditure as a percentage to the net sale, uh, <coughs> Huawei, you see the interesting phenomenon there. The black color is still Samsung, which is on this chart, in terms of the total dollar amount, is number one. But then in terms of uh, the percentage compared to net sale, Huawei is now number one. It's almost 14% versus Samsung, almost 7%. Double. It means two things. Huawei is not af as affordable as Samsung. And number two, Huawei is indeed investing a lot of money into R&D. So when you talk about the 5G, you know, 3G and 4G, you know, as you know, uh, there's no way that China can catch up with 3G and 4G. So a lot of Chinese technology companies invest heavily in, in 5Gs. And you know what? Chinese companies are already working on 6Gs. So, I am very much against the idea that this is a zero-sum game. I do not think, I represent a lot of Chinese tech companies. You know, I work with them, I, I'm friends with them. They're just normal people, just like me. They're not wolf. Uh, even though they're hungry, you know, they, they wanted to be successful. Again, philosophically, what's wrong with trying to be successful and try to have the so-called population mobility. If you can only work with China when China is poor, dirt poor, and dirt close, in close, if China is trying to get ahead and try to be as you know, uh, advanced as you are, and then you cannot work with them. I think there's something wrong with that argument. And I don't know, maybe that's because China is a communist country, therefore we cannot work with Chinese communist country, then we need to admit that. Um, in terms of the patent filing, so Huawei filed most patents, according to the WAPL, uh, 
uh, World Intellectual Property Organization. So in terms of government funding, so uh, GPS, I wanted to illustrate very quickly on the technologies that U.S. government has funded. Again, I'm not saying that this is wrong. I really support that. Why Silicon Valley became Silicon Valley? Because of the U.S. Department of Defense expenditure on semiconductor in the 1940s and 50s. Uh, so with pioneering technologies, commercial companies cannot afford to spend a lot of money. They rely on government funding to take more risk. So GPS is one example, and Siri is another example, which I use every day. And then what else? The touch screen technology was funded by the National Science Foundation and CIA. And how about our dear internet? Internet was the product of Cold War, funded by DAPA. And how many of you have uh, a Huawei phone in the audience? Okay. <laughs> and how many of you have uh, iPhone in the audience? Okay, terrific. So like, look at this chart. This is the iPhone. And look at the technologies <clears throat> that you are using as funded by U.S. government. And almost every single aspect of the gadgets behind iPhone have the traces of U.S. government funding. Again, I'm not saying that this is wrong. I support it. I think the ecosystem of science and technology requires government involvement. And, and that's how we develop the intellectual property. Thank you. Uh, our next speaker is David Mateo, to talk about the landscape for commercialization of technology. Good morning, everybody. It's a pleasure to be here with you this morning and a distinct privilege to be on the dais with such distinguished colleagues. Uh, if you don't mind, I'm just going to speak extemporaneously uh, and won't use slides. In fact, even if you do mind, I'm just going to do that since I didn't bring any slides. Um, so the United States has been the beneficiary of the largest, most profitable and productive economy in the world for the last 50 years. Not in small measure due to the fact that we have an enormously powerful IP and innovation ecosystem. But lately it seems we've been neglecting that benefactor, and I think my fear is that we're going to have a bill coming due, and it may even be a big one. So how do we find ourselves in this situation? Well, two reasons, I think. Uh, first is a series of domestic unforced errors, which could probably comprise a whole new conference in and of itself. The second is what Fareed Zakaria referred to as the rise of the rest. Simply put, the rest of the nations in the world are stepping up their game. So um, let me pick one, another one of those nations totally at random, um, maybe China. Let's talk about China. So <laughs> as you, <laughs> about that. So as you may have gleaned from Yabo's slides, uh, in terms of investment in R and national investment in R&D, China's set to eclipse the United States in and around 2020. But what's perhaps more compelling even than that is the rates of these changes. So over the last five years, the United States has increased its innovation investments by about 5%, which is roughly flat as a percentage of GDP. China, however, over that same five-year period, has increased its R&D investments by 20%. And that's a staggering 60% with respect to their GDP. In the IP dimension, we could surface myriad topics um, and I hope we'll do that more fully as a panel, with particular focus on distinguishing between reality, perception, misperception, and hyperbola. Uh, but just to, just to cite a few, um, again, you may have seen them as they, they whizzed by on Yavo's slides, but SIPO, the National Patent Office at China, in 2010 eclipsed the United States PTO as the patent office with the most filings, national filings. Several years later, they eclipsed a million patent filings. China has constituted specific and specialized IP courts, and the People's Supreme Court may even be hearing IP cases. China has changed in 2017 Article 25, which is its patent law. And just to give you an example, in one way, it's to expand the scope of patent subject matter to include things like some software and business methods. Interesting to note that's completely counter trend to the United States where the move has been to constrain the scope of patent protection. Now, taken as a whole, these sort of broad trends suggest that, not surprisingly, 
China's trying to establish for itself a home field advantage in its IP innovation ecosystem. Policies like Made in China 2025 have the effect of focusing these really broad trends, much like a magnifying glass focuses the rays of the sun into this bright searing spotlight focused on key technology capabilities and IP spaces necessary for the future. Just to name a few, autonomous vehicles, artificial intelligence, robotics, and clean tech. And just to use one of those as, as an example, artificial intelligence. Uh, more than 50% of all AI startups uh, that have been funded through all of time have been funded in the last two years to give you a sense of the scale and scope of the movement in AI. China, or rather Chinese companies, have been the recipient of 28%, or rather 38% of that money. The United States, only 28%. In the IP domain, five, six years ago, the United States and China were roughly at parity in terms of patents. Now, China has nearly three times as many AI-related patents. And another, albeit softer metric, um, if you look at the impact of AI on GDP, indicators suggest that in China, it's up around 26.5%. So AI is impacting 26.5% of the economy, which means that it is integrated in the ecosystem. It comprises the market and the innovation in the intellectual property. The number for the US economy is at about half that. So now again, in aggregate, these focus trends suggest that China is trying to establish for itself a home field advantage worldwide. And we should be very concerned. But that's not a concern driven by a complete and objective understanding of what this means now and into the future. It's a concern that should be driven by a move toward that understanding. Because without that, there's no way for us to solve our trade problems, nor frankly, our domestic problems. There's no trade policy, no matter how well conceived, that can solve issues arising from our own deficiencies in domestic innovation funding, perhaps overly constrained intellectual property protection, both of which constrain that IP and innovation ecosystem that gave us the economy these trade policies were intended to protect in the first place. So with that, I'll close and I'll pass it on to Mark, who will focus a little more for us on the IP dimension. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Damon. So uh, I don't know. I don't know whether I should stand up like you or go to the podium. I might just sit down so we have to show that we're completely three independent thinkers. I, I want to talk a little bit about the IP uh, uh, situation, uh, uh, since it is at the heart of the 301, as I said in my opening comments. Uh, there's a, a narrative that's out there. It's in the 301 report. It's in the press release that USTR made when it came back from the recent truce negotiations. You know, China is stealing our stuff. Uh, uh, forced technology transfer, IP theft, uh, bad IP enforcement. Uh, uh, a narrative that's been around for a long time. Some of it well-deserved, at least early on, although not all of it very factually based. And I think we're all pretty familiar with it if you pick up any mainstream newspaper or get on and look at the blogosphere, you'll see it. There's a counter narrative that's also out there. And Damon alluded a little bit to it when he mentioned, gee, you know, we've been weakening our patent protection almost at the same time as China has been strengthening its, including in areas like injunctive relief, where it's very hard to get an injunction. China is about 90% injunction ratio. Uh, and uh, including in um, success rates for foreigners litigating patents. I mean, the data, and I think one of the most dramatic events of the past several years in the Chinese legal system is a publication of cases and availability of data. Uh, the data base shows China judgments online, 30 million cases that came available, 470,000 IP cases, that foreigners win about 84% of the time in patent litigation. Chinese win 80% of the time. Gee, foreigners are doing better than Chinese. Not only that, an American, according to the data, if he, if he or it or she sues in China, the likelihood of success is higher in China 
than if they sued in their own country. In other words, it's about a 50 to 60 percent success rate on patent <laughs> litigation in the U.S. versus 84 percent. How is that consistent with that narrative? In some areas, in one court, the Beijing IP court, they boasted that, I think it was 2015, if I remember correctly, foreigners won every IP case they brought. So how is that consistent? This is another, another really interesting data set. It's very hard for me, professionally, to always be squaring these two narratives at one time. Do they coexist or are they oppositional? Uh, what I find troubling is that so much of what we talk about is anecdotal when we're not only good, getting lit, good litigation data, we're also getting good patent data. Now the problem with that narrative, that counterfactual, if you will, to the dominant 301 narrative about IP theft, is that it omits the deficiencies of the data and it doesn't focus on areas of core concern. So one of those deficiencies, which is also a counterfactual, if you will, is that only 1.2% of the IP litigation in China involves a foreigner. 1.2% in the most litigious society for IP in the world. And that's a declining percentage over the past several years. We're not dealing with a lot of cases. China, in case you didn't, were not, was not aware of it, is a much more domestically oriented IP environment than the US ever was, at least in recent history. In the US, 52% of the patents being filed come from foreigners. In China, it's about 15%. Litigation is probably 20 to 30% involving foreigners in the US. In China, it's 1.2%. So if I want to disabuse you of one thing here, it's the notion that foreigners are quantitatively this dominant factor in China. We are not. Not only that, folks who come out of this room saying, gee, China won't protect IP until it has IP of its own to protect. That threshold was passed 15 years ago. You know, Bill Alford, wonderful professor at Harvard University, wrote a book about it. It wasn't exactly right then. It's tremendously wrong now. You have an environment that's overwhelmingly China-oriented. If the threshold was whether the country has IP of its own to protect, Dominantly, China passed that threshold 10 years ago. That's not the issue here. So what is the issue? How do we end up with this? Foreigners not bringing lawsuits, overwhelmingly China-oriented system, IP ingrained into the ecosystem, how China wants to innovate and grow economically, and tremendous political pressure, a huge trade war brewing at the same time. The answer is kind of the counter-counterfactual. Because the reality is what you have, and this is consistent with the 301, is a very state-oriented IP system. I'm, I'm sometimes, frankly, jealous of the Chinese system for that. I wish we had a five-year plan when our own Supreme Court decided cases involving software patents or fintech, pack, fintech patents or genetic modifications, because that, that genetic engineering, because then they would think, well, you know, gee, this is important for the future of our country. Let's not be so, you know, uh, 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 ungenerous in deciding whether patent eligibility should exist on this innovation. But we don't, so we decide things kind of in the abstract on legal grounds, but China does. Uh, and that probably influences all the data I just gave you. And unfortunately, uh, I think the 301 report is particularly spare in this era of big data in using the data, which frankly could have been used to its advantage. Well, for example, if you look at patent grants in core technologies, what were we once called the strategic and emerging industries, it appears based on a data set of about 800,000 patents that a Swiss economist looked at that foreigners are discriminated against. They're discriminated against compared to non-core technologies and they're discriminated against uh, compared to Chinese applicants. Win rates for litigation, well, the database is not complete we know there's a lot of cases that are not being published. The largest patent judgment in Chinese history was against a foreigner. It involved Schneider Electric. It was about 330 million RMB about 10 years ago. Never published. So there's a lot of data we don't have. There are some preliminary injunctions. There's one big one that came out against Micron several months ago, another one against a company called Vico. Never published. Uh, so the, this intersection of industrial policy and intellectual property, whether it's a fair playing field, 
well, the USTR or the White House driven narrative is it's not fair, they're stealing our stuff. The counterfactual, which has a big set of, a big audience says, well, that's not exactly true. Foreigners are doing pretty well. The counter counterfactual is, you know, we really have to be careful about how we link the two because there does to be a pair, appear to be a link. It's just not very well articulated. Let me give you another example, which is also at the core of the 301, which is licensing. So the US really hasn't taken up this issue, hadn't taken up this issue until the Trump administration uh, came, to, came to be. Uh, and then we filed a WTO case on China's uh, 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 discriminatory licensing regime that basically uh, denies foreigners the opportunity of an owning improvements on technology they license to China if the collaboration is done in China. Okay, so it's basically, if you're a foreigner licensing technology, you can't negotiate around ownership of improvements, around indemnities for uh, use of the technology, and around use of the technology in third markets. Uh, but basically, for a startup in Silicon Valley, that means that if you were licensing technology to a Chinese entity directly, you're basically providing litigation insurance, because you're saying, I'm gonna insure you against any third party risk. And that would not attach to a license that occurred solely within China. Okay, so that's kind of a discriminatory provision. If you look at the data, and remember the 301 is really concerned about IP theft. China buys as much legitimately in US technology, and by the way, I think that's a good thing if China buys technology, certainly better than stealing it, and I think it helps a collab create a collaborative platform, buys about as much in technology as Taiwan, mainland China compared to Taiwan, about five to six billion dollars a year, about half of Japan. So Taiwan at about 1 30th the population of China is as big a legitimate technology market as China, or half of Japan. But China is the largest producer of IT products in the world, and the largest manufacturer of high-tech products in the world. There's WIPO data, there's OEC data on both. China is anywhere from 20 to 30 percent of world production. They are 3% of US technology purchases. What is filling that gap? If China were to buy as much technology as it uses in producing high-tech products, that would be $30 billion more coming into the US Treasury or into US company rights holders. So people who say this problem doesn't exist, that's a pretty hard thing to deny. Basically, for whatever reason, whether it's state policy, uh, uh, that says steal, and there's some people who subscribe to that, or state policy that inspires people to cut corners thinking they can get away with things, you're seeing a massively under-licensed environment. Perfect example of that, and I think perhaps the note that I'll end up on, is last month InterDigital had an appeal to the Supreme People's Court. They make 4G, they have their, their holder of standard essential patents in 4G, 3G, 2G, and 5G. They lost a case four or five years ago that was never published, by the way, another problem with the database, the first instance case. Uh, and the royalty rate for their license to Huawei, if I recall correctly, was 0.0016%. Extremely low. And the way it was calculated was problematic. Supreme People's Court says, you know what? That's not a good calculation. It's going to get recalculated now. They had to wait four years. You could look at that and say, okay, the court is doing the right thing, which I believe it is. But you could also take Yabo's perspective that China is investing a hell of a lot in R&D. It's gonna be a licensor too. Huawei, what I've heard, would like to have a royalty rate of five to 10% on 5G. And to have this precedent out there of 0.0016% doesn't really help Huawei or ZTE or any other Chinese innovator in demanding rents from foreigners for 5G technology. So this is a very kind of perhaps orchestrated situation or perhaps a decision consistent with rule of law that they're saying, okay, we made a mistake and we're correcting it. But the heavy hand of the state is pretty easy to imagine in that kind of decision-making process in terms of commercialization of IP. So with that, I could speak for a half hour and then it deprived all these others uh, of, of hearing what everybody else has to say. But uh, with that, I think we'll open it up to discussion amongst ourselves and ultimately the audience. So I think I'll turn it to Yabo and Damon. In light of everything we just heard, 
Um, do you think the U.S. response to the IP threat is measured too much or too little? Uh, I, I would say briefly that uh, I, I found your uh, statistics fascinating, and thank you. Probably the best, frankly, IP uh, presentation I have ever heard. Oh, thank in you. The trade uh, arena is very uh, 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 breathtaking, if you will. Uh, I wanted to say one thing. I, I think the U.S. policy uh, against uh, Chinese misappropriation of intellectual property, uh, overall, I think sometimes give people the feeling that it's very political size. Um, uh, so I think U.S. perhaps could take a more rule-based approach. You know, for example, take uh, Section 301 report, as an example. It cited the Qualcomm situation. Uh, it says that, you know, China uh, penalized uh, Qualcomm for licensing practices almost $1 billion. That is really bad. Uh, this is one example of Chinese government taking down on the U.S. company uh, for the benefit of the domestic uh, winners. But, but Qualcomm, as you know, uh, was also penalized by the Korean uh, Fair Trade Commission, was also penalized by the German uh, Fair Trade Commission, I'm sorry, the EU Fair Trade Commission, and then also the Japanese Fair Trade Commission. And US FTC is now suing as we speak, is having a hearing before just call against Qualcomm for the so-called practice in violation of FRAN, you know, fair, reasonable, and non-discriminatory uh, uh, licensing practice. So to use that as one example in the overall government attack on China, I think it's very misplaced. I'm sure the U.S. government make a lot of legitimate uh, allegations against China. But if you include that one in, you almost like cloud the whole picture. Right, and, and I think you know, the Qual there's another Qualcomm situation as well, which for people who are following the news, you know, Qualcomm got an injunction against um, Apple in Fuzhou. They got an injunction, I believe, against Intel or Apple in Germany. Where did they not get an injunction against uh, Intel? Washington, D.C., the International Trade Commission declined to issue an exclusion order on public policy grounds, which gets back into Damon's point about this kind of self-inflicted wounds on the U.S. system. Increasingly, people are saying, gee, if China's a chokehold, because 90% of the cell phones are manufactured in China, and if they're offering software patents and AI-related patents and fintech patents in a more robust way than the U.S., and if you can get an injunctive relief, why am I suing in the United States? Uh, uh, and it's faster, too, and cheaper. So yeah. it's faster, cheaper, more certain. You know, so uh, I look at this from the sort of macro perspective, but also the micro perspective. Uh, academically, I look at it from the macro perspective, national competitiveness, but just let me tunnel down uh, on the micro perspective, because uh, you know, I represent companies that do business and transactions in and between China. And uh, to your question about is the government doing too much or, or not enough, I don't, I don't think our government responses are sufficiently grounded in data, and I don't mean just the data that you talked about, but the actual real reasons that, to your point, about innovation and intellectual properties are investments. They're investment vehicles for companies, and when they take them to China, uh, they don't feel that they're protected or that they can get the appropriate return on investment for myriad different reasons. And people are bumping up against these misperceptions. They're bumping up against home court advantage. Um, and all of these things, I think, wrap around the notion of you know, US companies being able to properly and effectively integrate with China in, in an intellectual property and innovation perspective. Yeah, I mean, for those of you who have sufficient gray hair, um, in the mid 80s, there was an office called the Office of Technology Assessment in yes. Congress. They did a great report on, China, on licensing practice and technology transfer to China. It's a yellow book I proudly keep on my bookshelf. Uh, and some of the people who wrote that at the beginning of their career, like Craig Allen, Pete Suttmeyer, later on, went on to great careers in the government or in academia. 
Uh, we also had a technology administration, the Department of Commerce, that no longer exists, and we defunded OSTP. Uh, uh, I mean, all of those things were happening at the same time as we're saying that technology is a great concern to us. Uh, in fact, if you go to the Commerce Department in, in almost any office in the world where they have posts overseas, and you say, gee, you know, you guys are actively promoting steel and autos and uh, you know, hard good exports. What are you doing to promote technology? You'll almost invariably find a dumb look because it's not a subject of export promotion. And the knowledge about how to commercialize it has kind of evaporated it, it, uh, from, from the halls of the U.S. government to a degree. Yeah, it doesn't figure prominently, and that's an understatement. Yeah. Yeah, and, and that's a real disconnect because, you know, back to my original point, we'll, we'll never be able to fully address our trade issues unless we fully understand completely and objectively what they are. And worse than not understanding them, I don't feel like we're making an objective effort to do so. But are, is this just a classic, you know, everything is bright and sunny in California and everything is dark and gloomy in Washington, D.C.? Ha that's having true, ha having that's just true. moved here, yeah, well, at the moment especially, are there other reasons that there seems to be a, kind of a bi-coastal perspective on this issue? Uh, I think there are. And, um, you know, one of the things that, you know, having been a native of California since actually I came to school here, um, there's this feeling of sort of invincibility throughout all the, all the economic downturns. Silicon Valley has largely been immune and the, the housing crunch is largely immune. So we have this sort of, you know, we have Kevlar long johns on, you know, nothing's gonna be able to touch us. And I think that operates a little bit, except to the extent now, so if you sort of rewind history back to AIA and all the lobbying that was being done, need to diminish the power of intellectual property rights. All these patent tickets, patent tickets rather, are crushing us. Apple is saying that the royalty stacking is making us so uncompetitive. But if you lift up the hood and you realize that actual data-driven arguments, which is the first time that this happens, is the royalty stacking problem in an iPhone is it about, tops out at about 2.8%. So they're not huge issues at all. I wanted to, I'm yeah, sorry, Mark. Go ahead. I wanted to comment a little bit on uh, what you just alluded to very briefly regarding the Apple Qualcomm uh, lawsuit in China. Again, I found this uh, rhetoric and, and the storyline or the, you know, uh, the way people wanted to perceive it interesting. On December uh, the 10th, uh, a uh, intellectual property court in Fuzhou, and by the way, the Chinese intellectual property court system, as you know, did not come into existence until 2014. So we're only talking about less than five years. <clears throat> uh, so you know, I know that is a, a, a very tiring excuse for China that we're still trying, we're still get up to speed. I know, but the reality is that yes, it's a very new system. Give China some time. So anyway, the Fuzhou Intellectual Property Court, December the 10th, issue. Uh, the injunctive relief uh, is cruising order, uh, saying that, uh, okay, so uh, Apple, in the Apple case against Qualcomm, or Qualcomm sue Apple in China, so this case involved no Chinese company. Uh, the court said that Apple 7, Apple 8 Plus, and you know, the older models, the Apple uh, cell phones cannot be uh, sold in, in China. So that's 10 days after the summit in Argentina. The US mainstream media, uh, you know, big headline, and I'm, qu I'm quoting, China just dragged Apple into Trump's trade war. And then, and then inside the article it says, this is a very convenient way for China to bring Apple into the foray in the same way the US government did with Huawei. So, I think it's so dangerous to politicize, you know, uh, a lawsuit between Apple and Qualcomm. And then 10 days later, December the 20th, German, a German court in Munich issued almost the same exclusive order, saying that Apple must not sell Apple 7, uh, iPhone 7, 8, and 8 Plus in Germany. The same order. But the news headline read, Apple older models block in Germany. That's it. Factual. 
so I wish that they could report the Chinese verdict the way they reported the German verdict. Yeah, the, yeah. so the, that, that's, that's, a, that's a topic unto itself, the Fujo court and semiconductor litigation, but it's a very interesting comparison of how everything is getting politicized at this moment in time and getting bent in a particular direction. But I not, think, yeah, if I may, just yeah. to put a period, not just um, in this particular period of time. I, I agree with you, and from a normative perspective, these things should not be politicized. But if you rewind history to AIA, uh, that was a highly politicized event, and yeah. that was here in the United States. And my guess would be the very same interests who pushed so hard for Congress to reduce the scope of patent protection and reduce 284 damages will be the very same people who were banging on Congress's doors five years from now and saying, what did you do to us? Right. And the Chinese are eating our lunch because one of the scant few advantages U.S. companies would have had would have been a huge repository of patents to use as in ammunition here in the United States. You know, this, this is so serious. Damon isn't going, but tomorrow I'm going to a conference about where one, I'm supposed to moderate a panel on whether the U.S. should be looking to China for guidance on patent eligibility issues. I kid you not, in Washington, D.C., and that's what I'm presenting on. Uh, uh, so we have a few moments for Q&A. Yep. Uh, Two-part question. First is, as you know, you know, you talked about the quantity of IPs produced in each country, but as you know, not all patents are created equal. Huge difference between essential and non-essential patents. Can you speak to the quality of patents that are filed in the U.S. versus China? So I, I can do that. I can do that very quickly, uh, uh, and then maybe we'll have time for your second question. So, you know, if you're going to start using qualitative metrics, there's a lot of uh, useful information. Some of it is not available in China, but some of it is. Some of it is. China, for example, looks at whether patents are made while in the service of an employer, as an indicator of quality. So they dismiss smaller inventors. By the way, China has enough patents filed by individual inventors in the garage that the total quantity would exceed the number of patents filed in total at the USPTO. So these individual inventors are not small in quantity, but they're generally dismissed as low quality. Uh, so if you're going to start looking at qualitative metrics, look at commercialization. When I was at the PTO, we looked at the correspondence between Chinese exports to the US and patents being filed, whether they were in the same fields of use. Look at forward citation data. So is the patent being cited in subsequent patents? It's very hard to get that out of China. And regrettably, in a recent case involving uh, Huawei and Samsung, the court in Shenzhen totally dismissed US data on forward citation, even though China did not have it. Another question about whether industrial policy is intervening in there. Uh, so if you started taking all these metrics, you would see that there, uh, uh, not everything is high quality, but you would also be surprised at some of the things that are high quality. For example, unexamined utility model patents usually are an indicator of low quality because they're not examined. But companies like Huawei and Foxconn routinely use them for products where there's an immediate commercial uptake, where they realize they have to get protection immediately, otherwise the infringers are going to come onto the market. So you have to be very careful on qualitative measures. But the reality is, as with scientific publications, uh, we're seeing a lot of quantity we're seeing uh, you know, a patent system on steroids, uh, but that doesn't necessarily correspond to quality. Yeah, I would add that you're going to, it's going to be these natural lag effects associated with all of these different phenomena that we're talking about. Huge investments in innovation, there's going to be lag effects to making it state of the art. Same with the patent system. And my experience isn't statistically significant as an individual, but over the last Six or eight years, I've seen, in general, Chinese patents go way up in terms of what we would consider quality. I don't know that anybody on the panel has a different opinion. Significantly better. The second question is, you have a lot of foreign companies with R&D centers in China. To what extent are foreign companies actually benefiting from the innovative capacity of their Chinese workers or employees? You want to pick that up, Tim? Yeah, you know, I think that it, it varies wildly depending upon how they've been set up, what the intention was, uh, whether it's for the benefit of the Chinese domestic market or whether they're going to pull things back into more broad use worldwide. Um, and it also depends upon how deep their understanding was of, say, for example, some of the forced technology transfer that arose with the Indigenous Innovation Acts, uh, if and how that was going to constrain their options. So, 
it may be an uneven playing field, but to the extent that you understand the lay of the land, you can get far better utility out of the innovations that you're creating there. Yeah. That's right. Uh, thanks for a very interesting panel. Um, the U.S. federal government just tightened export control laws. Um, I would love to get your view on how that could impact the short and long-term flow of IP from the U.S. to China and how it does impact the thinking of foreign companies to invest in R&D facilities here in Silicon Valley and the U.S. Yeah, so so there, there are two aspects to heightened export control laws uh, and also CFIUS regimes because they're going to be more or less in tandem. Uh, um, one is with respect to CFIUS, it's uh, non-passive, uh, uh, non-controlling investments are uh, subject to regulation. So you could be a small minority investor, but if you have a window into the technology that's regulated. So that, that could impact early stage startups and, and more foundational research that may be going on. That was a subject of the DOD report, DIUX, some time ago about Chinese investment in early stage AI. And in fact, that seems to have been a weakness in the Chinese ecosystem around AI. Uh, the other part, which I find more problematic in, in terms of export controls, is the effort to address what they call foundational technologies, particularly foundational emerging technologies. And that is a huge span. There was a re recent Federal Register notice that identified lots of fields, including in AI and biotech and other areas. Uh, and the problem is that gray definition of what constitutes something foundational. And what the difference is between foundational and fundamental research, which traditionally has been exempt from export controls. You have this potential for uh, the companies may exclude uh, Chinese or other employees that are of concern, countries of concern, from early stage research unnecessarily. They may be depriving themselves of talent. If it's not multilateralized, then obviously China or other countries will go to countries that have more liberal uh, approaches towards export controls to conduct research. And we may end up uh, in the situation like we were in with Chin Shui Sun uh, back in the 1950s, where we send very talented Chinese individuals back to China, where they then develop nuclear bombs and things like that. So uh, it, 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 I think it's a very difficult area to draw a line in. I'm also concerned about the um, capacity of Treasury and BIS, because uh, you know the Federal Register notice talks about whether technology is publicly available. Uh, having evaluations done of whether technology is publicly available, coming from the patent office is not an easy task. Uh, the PTO is a huge database of both patent and non-patent literature. And one of the first things you want to know is whether it's, been, it's publicly disclosed. Uh, uh, and that requires PhDs sitting there for weeks at a time reviewing the subject technology. Are we going to be able to do that? in the export control regime without impeding the development of technology and without creating parallel universes where China is doing the same thing we're doing and we could do it more efficiently together. Yeah, just two other elements. Um, on the investment side, um, part of our practice is M&A new business creation cross-border. So we've seen a significant downturn in investment in U.S. Uh, startup companies and to a large extent M&A. Um, but what we, have to, what we have to get past is, again, this sort of natural American tendency to believe that the whole world and everything revolves around us. Uh, in general, Chinese FDI into the United States fell off a cliff at the end of 2017, and it wasn't because of Pharma or CFIUS. It was because of China reining in irrational investment. So you have a number of different things operating. Um, so we've seen it drop significantly. But if you look, for example, uh, to your question about flow, uh, Pharma uh, provide specific exclusions for controls over greenfield investment and largely over licensing. So there's, there's the opportunity, but I don't think it's being fully utilized. And just to add to that, I mean, the gaping hole for me is talent flow. Yeah. So, you know, we, we don't have the authority to tell a Chinese PhD, you can never go back to your home country. And I doubt they would come to this country if we did. Uh, and so uh, being unable to control talent flow and in, and in uh, uh, you know, California is notorious for not being able to even uh, have enforceable non-compete agreements <laughs> uh, uh, is, is the gaping hole. You, you, if you create a dam and you leave a little bit open in the dam with more pressure behind it, you're just going to see a lot of uh, you know, that pressure going through that, that gaping hole. And I think that we may be seeing a lot more uh, trade secret, criminal trade secret cases, civil trade secret cases, 
uh, non-compete issues in the near future the, to the extent this ramps up. Mark Damon Yavo, thank you very much. Please join me in thanking this panel.